Welcome to Renew Power Presents Pathway to a Fossil Free India, partnered by ET Now. Now, we are joined here by an eminent panel of clean energy and corporate experts to understand the various facets of clean energy adoption in India and how the corporate sector can be a front runner in the adoption of green energy. With us, we have Suman Sinha, Chairman and CEO, Renew Power, SN Subramanian, CEO and MD, Larson and Tubro. Sunil Dugal, Group CEO with Anta Limited, and Diane Holdorf, Managing Director of Food and Nature at the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. Thank you so much for joining me here. Mr. Sinha, let's start with you. Now, a recent BNEF report pegs the rise in corporate purchase of renewable energy globally at about 40%. Uh, a, a WWF report said that almost 22% of the companies listed in NSC have renewable energy procurement targets and also with India's commitment at COP26. Your thoughts on the corporate commitment to renewable energy, it needs significant increase. But your thoughts on companies taking interest in clean energy, how are you seeing the tide change? What are the differences you're noticing? Yeah, thank you, Sumit. Uh, you know, I think um, uh, two big imperatives, of course, are that uh, climate change is a real issue. It's a very significant issue as we, as we witnessed. At COP26, uh, countries are coming together to try to fight the whole climate change situation. But equally, I would say that corporates have also realized that they need to play a role. And um, there is therefore partly uh, their own recognition and partly there is also pressure that is coming in from various global investors who are now saying that they will use ESG as one of the, as, one, as a very important criteria for making investment decisions on uh, corporates. And so I think there is some degree of pressure as well as the fact that it's the right thing to do. And therefore, there is, a, I think, and still at this point, an, in, an incipient movement among corporates to start moving towards becoming more uh, focused on purchasing clean energy. I would say it's still at early stages. Uh, there's a lot more work that needs to be done. Uh, but I can clearly see that corporates have begun to start thinking about these kinds of issues. Um, both voluntarily and, and being pressured into it. So I think it's the start of something really that is going to become more meaningful in the future. That's the important part. It's a start and it's a good start at that. Uh, Mr. Subramanian, now, you know, LNT is spread across multiple sectors. Just wanting to get your opinion on some of the challenges that are there in clean energy adoption in the hard to abate sectors. What are your thoughts on that, sir? Interesting question because uh, we are not only present in the sectors where uh, a huge amount of movement towards green has to be made, but we are also consumers of products that these sectors make, which inherently make it uh, uh, carbon uh, ineffective. So that is, that is, it's a tremendous change that has to occur. We build cement plants and we use cement. And cement is one of the major producers of carbon dioxide, because when you heat uh, calcium oxide, uh, uh, the carbon dioxide comes out. Similarly, we, we build steel plants and we also consume a huge amount of steel. So to make steel and when you have to liberate uh, uh, iron out of Fe203, carbon monoxide uh, forms. Similarly, when you make fertilizers, ammonia, uh, uh, what you call ammonia has to be made, uh, which is a fertilizer and therefore natural gas is used and carbon dioxide is released. So it, it, it's paradoxical, right? So the world needs all these things, but at the same time, uh, due to climate change effects, due to the hostile nature of these climate change effects and, uh, and the nature that uh, uh, of life that is going on, not only in the Western world, but also in our parts of the world where you see unusual storms, monsoons, uh, very, very heated climate in the summer, etc. It's an imperative today. Uh, the global heat warming is very evident. And, and therefore, if we, if, we, if we don't attempt something and make a start somewhere, this is never going to get achieved. So for organizations like us, though we do a lot of uh, uh, efforts towards green in the sense that we do a lot of water conservation projects, we plant more than a million trees every year, um, uh, we, we, we try to use substances like fly ash, etc. to neutralize some of the uh, negative effects of some of the things that we are, that we are having to do from a from a from a production point of view, I think it is inevitable that we start not only thinking but accelerate our movement towards the the green nature of how we go about. 
recently we also mentioned about a sustainability policy where, where we said by 2040 we'll get down to a sustainable sustainable level of how our organization moves forward and it is just not as the entire ecosystem has to move all our vendors subcontractors suppliers everybody has to move towards it's a massive effort but as suman correctly said i think we have started on the path and uh, once you start on the path, a company like us is used to working with certain amount of budget, target, expectations every year. And we, and we have the habit of evaluating ourselves. Uh, people like us have the habit of looking into the mirror each day and seeing what we have done. The organization also has the same philosophy of looking at uh, itself every quarter, every few months to see where it has gone forward on that path. I think right. finally, this is bound to have its effect and on, on climate change and, and on, on ESG and how we go about it. Yes. Mr. Dugal, what are the challenges in the clean energy adoption in hard to abate sectors? Natural resource sector is so called hard to abate sector, but uh, uh, the production of metals, production of uh, cement, steel, uh, these are very energy intensive sectors. And uh, especially aluminium requires a lot of power to produce one ton of metal. So the challenge is to decarbonize these sectors that uh, the energy is used in many forms. Uh, it could be fuel energy where or pyroprocessing or heat, uh, heating the metal, uh, you may require the energy. You also require energy for processing. So the energy could be fed in two parts. One is the electrical energy, another is the uh, energy required for the process. And as I told this, being the energy intensive sector, uh, you require big power. So normally, this sector has been establishing the captive power plants to get the quality of power. It is very sensitive to power interruptions. And uh, when you have to go for renewable energy or you have to reduce your carbon footprint. You will have to set up renewable energy parks somewhere and you will have to transmit power. So the infrastructure in today's context is such that it could have impact on the quality of power and the continuity of power. So these are some of the challenges uh, which we face. But apart from that, uh, as I told that it, being an energy intensive sector, it requires setup of large renewable parks, be it solar, wind. And from all those uh, places, the power will have to be transmitted, wheeled uh, to the location where uh, we produce our metals. Or we produce cement, steel. So these are some of the uh, problems we face. But apart from that, uh, the government regulation is also important because they treat uh, the wheeling or transmission of power uh, with the usual power. So there are right. no special uh, laws or regulation which could facilitate uh, the transmission of renewable power at much economical rate because you know today in today's world it has been established that uh, the renewable power could be made even cheaper than the black power but the transmission the quality and the interruptions these are three four things which are which come in the way of you know, change of our black power from the captive mode to the transmitted mode. Diane, what is WBCSD's role in promoting corporate adoption of clean energy? Thank you so much for that question and what WBCSD's role is in promoting the corporate adoption of clean energy. It's a critical one and it's one that we urgently need to all take action on. WBCSD, for a bit of context, is a CEO-led organization that works with leading businesses around the world with over 200 member companies to collectively accelerate the system transformations that are needed for a net zero world. 
In the energy space in particular, we've been helping to drive the global movement for corporate renewable procurement really since the inception of that movement. In particular, we've been part of the PPA movement through WBCSD's Corporate Renewables PPA Forum. This forum helps to increase understanding and the use of power purchase agreements across the world to accelerate their use and application. We've implemented targeted work in India in particular on this, including the India Corporate Renewable PPA Forum and our ongoing energy storage work where stakeholders across the renewable energy and energy storage value chains work with each other to enable the adoption of energy storage solutions in India. It's this kind of integrated value chain working and collaboration that is actually critical that gets us to those transformations. It's time for a short break here on Renew Power Presents Pathway to a Fossil Free India partnered by ET Now. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Renew Power Presents Pathway to a Fossil Free India partnered by ET Now. My discussion continues. Forward the point that Mr. Subramanian made because he was talking about steel. Uh, on that particular point, because you know, in your opinion, are companies with sustainable business operations able to command a premium on their products or services? Because you know, why should a steel maker or a mining company venture into something so to say, maybe you know, green steel, if we call it? Is it would, is that because they would be able to command a premium? I think eventually, yes, they will be able to as uh, as society becomes more conscious of these kinds of issues. Uh, and, and let me put it a different way. Companies that don't go down this path may actually start getting penalized. Uh, and so what may happen is that while on the one hand, maybe by itself, continuing to sell, let's say, for want of a better word, gray steel, made in a normal way, uh, you may get a certain pricing for it. Certainly in the beginning, uh, financial investors will start actually penalizing you for in terms of valuation and so on. So I think at some point, uh, it will just become uh, not worthwhile for steel companies not to go down the path of becoming clean themselves uh, because of societal pressure as well as financial market pressure. Right, Mr. Sinha. Uh, Mr. Subramanian, you know, there's one other thing you, you spoke about this earlier about, um, you know, LNT's plan to achieve net zero by 2040. Uh, Again, you yourself admit it's, it is a big task and with a company as big as l &T. But just an insight into what would it take to build like a net zero infrastructure company, some thoughts, some insights, if you could share with us. Frankly, uh, the, there is no definition of what is a net zero company, right? It's, it's, uh, it's, it's a definition which is created by ourselves. It's a target that, that we put on ourselves to do it. Uh, we, we do roads and airports and power projects and, you know, uh, buildings and all kinds of things. So we have to start somewhere. So how do we start it? You, you take our own campuses. We try to make it uh, a neutral campus, uh, zero water discharge, uh, capturing whatever heat is possible to make solar, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to have, uh, uh, to have use the, the discharge water for plants and other purposes to improve energy efficiency within the building using softwares like building management systems, so on and so forth. Uh, use eco-friendly uh, products while constructing the building. Uh, uh, use of renewable power or microgrid from a, from a power consumption point of view. Uh, uh, all our campuses are huge trees. In fact, even now a tree plantation campaign is going on. Uh, I was told there are more than uh, 50,000 trees across our campus and we are continuing to put more. Even I planted a few trees a few days back. Uh, there are many other solutions on, on uh, for example, in a factory complex at Hazira, we are putting up a pilot hydrogen plant to see how it works out. So I think the, 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 these may look small steps or what's the big deal, what's the big thing that you're doing. Ultimately, it is it is capturing the culture that we, we want to be, we want to be clean, we want to be green, we want to be conscious about how how we are the entire uh, ecosystem of the atmosphere and how, how, how we are dealing with the situation. What are the major challenges that you have seen corporates face while going green? Is it the cost? Is it the knowledge? Diane, what's your take on this? So I think the first point to highlight here is that while there are certainly challenges for companies as they integrate sustainability into core strategy and operations, this is quickly becoming a mainstream expectation. And climate action is an area where companies can actually quite quickly make progress 
toward reducing their greenhouse gas emissions. We're in a very exciting time, particularly for corporate renewable procurement. Just a few years ago, only a handful of leading companies were procuring renewable power for their operations. But now we've seen first an explosion of commitments. Over 340 companies have committed to procuring 100% renewable power to the RE100 initiative. This grew by 30% last year alone. So this shows the speed and the amount of interest that this is generating and creates a really important demand signal to the market. But secondly, and frankly, more importantly, is that these commitments are being translated into action. And this was one of our big callouts during COP26 last month. I'm really happy to say that companies who are adopting clean energy is one of the areas where we're seeing that translation into action move fastest and where we're seeing real progress in that implementation front. One metric to measure this by is the increasing renewable energy capacity signed through corporate PPAs globally. For example, data from Bloomberg and EF shows that this has grown from around four gigawatts that were signed in 2015 to 2016 to an astonishing almost 24 gigawatts in 2020 alone. We haven't yet seen the final 2021 numbers, but we know that it's set to be another record-breaking year. And this is what really drives the action, the demonstration of that type of progress and growth. So that indicates that in addition to the demand signal being clear, the supply is responding to that and driving that availability, driving cost availability and access as well. Now, Mr. Dugal, Vedanta has made some bold commitments, but two stand out particularly, such as net zero by 2050 or sooner and 2.5 gigawatts of round the clock renewable energy. Could you shed some light on these and how you plan on achieving these? Yeah, so we have made very bold commitment. These are 10 bold commitments where we said that uh, uh, we will be carbon neutral by 2050. Uh, in the next 10 years, what story we want to unfold? And we have made a credible story where we, we have said that what we will do in the next few years, and which could be scrutinized and people could also watch that what we are doing. So the 2.5 gigawatt of round-the-clock uh, renewable energy, we have made a plan. We want to hive off a separate company within Vedanta, which could really focus only on renewable power. And uh, to do that, uh, uh, it could be through the PPA signed with the standalone company, of course, at the arm's length, uh, meeting all regulatory requirements and legal requirements. But this would help us uh, to have our own capacity where uh, some of the challenges which I earlier said that uh, these are the ongoing challenges for the natural resource sector to uh, transition to the renewable energy, those challenges could be met and uh, we find the right answers for those challenges. Mr. Sina, coming to you, um, you know, some statistics uh, say that uh, green electricity is expected to cleanse about 20% of the greenhouse uh, gas emissions. Uh, do you think initiatives such as green hydrogen, which has the potential to reduce emissions by a huge quantum, we'll see adoption despite the fact that it may be costlier than the conventional methods because doing good for the planet is one thing but it's got to be doing good for the balance sheet also how does how do you how do you recommend how do you advise companies to balance this correctly well you know so far uh, in the uh, power sector which is really where we've gone furthest on the decarbonization journey uh, renewable energy obviously has now emerged as a viable solution viable both technologically as well as from a commercial standpoint. Um, but unfortunately, power or electricity represents only about 20% of total energy consumption. Um, in some countries, perhaps 25%. The balance of the energy consumption actually sits in other areas. Mobility, for example, aviation, uh, shipping, uh, in uh, the, the industrial sectors and so on. And those sectors, it's much harder for uh, to electrify uh, and uh, of course, once you electrify them, then you know you can make that electrification clean as well. Now, uh, hydrogen has emerged as the bridging fuel 
that allows electrification to deepen into some of these sectors because you can now start using green hydrogen to a replace the gray hydrogen wherever it is used which is a very significant emitter of carbon dioxide and uh, you can also get into other use cases for example through fuel cells into mobility and so on which otherwise were not possible and so uh, hydrogen therefore represents this you know great opportunity to expand the whole electricity footprint within the energy sector and there are various studies that have shown that over the next uh, 30 years uh, electrification might actually go from 20 percent of energy consumption up to about 60 to 70 percent and green hydrogen will represent about 15 to 20 percent of that so it is a very significant uh, uh, actually move forward now are companies doing enough will companies do enough and i, I think that look eventually obviously today green hydrogen is more expensive than gray hydrogen uh, but that cost will come down as we've seen happening in the case of solar as we're likely to see happening in the case of batteries as well as technology improves as scale improves costs do come down dramatically great thank you for that mr sinha uh, mr subramaniam just one last question to you um, you know what kind of policy support is required for companies in the infrastructure sector to ensure adoption of clean technologies what can the government do to help i would base it uh, broader uh, infrastructure is one part of the overall economic activity right we have to look at it as a national imperative uh, uh, for example if if we really want to give the entire population of our country people a, a better way of life we have to take this climate uh, 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 in a way if i can use the word destruction in a in a very very serious manner uh, it is all also a national imperative it's it's a it's a it's a sensitive national topic you see what's happened today 70 or 80 percent of polysilicon is made by one country 70 80 percent of modules is made by one country and if you want to put up a solar in india we got to import it from there there are module makers in india but not at the scale and capacity and the price that at which it comes from there because we can put artificial duty to to scale it up but that's you're building an inefficient uh, base or economic situation we too from an indian point of view from a country imperative point of view scale in some of these things for example to manufacture polysilicon in india to make up from nodules to modules within the country to set up uh, electrolyzer plants within the country to make grid batteries within the country to of course have the technology to make uh, hydrogen finally so that is what this one once this partnership between renew and lnt is all about well, that's all the time that we have today on this special episode of Renew Power Presents Pathway to a Fossil-Free India, partnered by ET Now. Thank you so much for watching.